Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining our conversation here. Is everybody ready to get started? At this conference, and more generally in the PBM industry, we've been hearing a lot of conversation about pricing. Uh, rebates, anybody heard the word rebates in the last few weeks or months? Well, we're not really here to talk about rebates today. We're actually going to talk about a different part of the PBM conversation. We'll speak about it a little bit, but more from the technology perspective. I mean, it's not a secret to anyone that the PBM business model is under um, review to not say assault, starting in Washington, D.C., but, but in, in, every, in every hall and every, in every client, asking questions about how is value getting created and how is it being shared with the different stakeholders that, that are entitled to that value. A little known challenge or opportunity is a, a, a major obstacle that people aren't quite of a, as aware of in the PBM industry is, is around the service experience. And so today we're gonna to talk about what technology has to do with the service experience and the opportunity to take PBM technology as a driver to changing the service experience into the future. When you hear PBM and technology, or at least when I hear it, and I've, we've been in the business for, for over a decade now, this is the thought that, that comes to mind. Does everybody remember this? This is what most of the PBMs in our country are still working with. And those of you who are from the industry know exactly what I'm talking about. How is that even possible? I don't know, but let's explore a little bit. So this guy is not very flexible. That's why. Um, we're saying the PBM technology today is, is inflexible. Right? Anyone who's tried to do something creative or different in a short amount of time has found that generally the answer is no or not now or that's going to take a long time and it's going to cost a lot of money. Does that resonate with anybody out here in the, in the audience? I'm seeing some nodding. Okay, nod if you're breathing. Good, at least there's breathing, good. So very inflexible. There's consensus around that. She's not friendly. Therefore, it's user unfriendly and developer unfriendly. I guess she's the developer and he's the user. But um, you know, it's anybody who's tried to use the technology, forget about changing it, but using it. I mean, these are, these are legacy systems and software platforms, many of which were built in the late 80s and the early 90s. And technology was, was very different back then. You know, the big, it was when graphical user interface was just starting. I heard somebody say green screens, right? To learn about all the F keys. You know what I'm talking about? The shortcuts, the people who got really good at navigating through the system. Well, you know, we live in a, in a not just a point and click world, but a beyond point and click world. We live in a, in a web cloud-based world where you use dozens of applications every single day by just touching what you want. And you really don't have to have a lot of explanation. You just sort of figure it out and without any training, without any, any, any user guide. I mean, when was the last time someone out here read a user guide around a new application that they wanted to use? Sounds like not recently. So when it comes to friendliness, you know, there, there's a huge opportunity. Lack of interoperability, and I, and I don't love this word interoperability because frankly I think it's been so overused in the last 20 years that people are just tired of hearing it. It's like the holy grail. I mean, if someone tells me about connecting medical and pharmacy again, you know, I might as well just get out of business. But well, I'll say it again just one more time. You know, these systems generally live in silos and making them talk to each other is an, inc it's, it's like climbing Mount Everest. Why is that? Because they were built in old technology because they're closed and they're not built on modern data architectures that are designed to plug and play with everybody else. And they're built upon the notion that value is created by controlling the access to data rather than being opened in what is today called an API framework or an application programming interface framework. It's sort of like the opposite of what Google is all about, Google Maps. You know, all the different Google services or, or you, know, you can go on and on with, with the different services that, that the service providers have. Basically Uber, you know, Waze, all of these, these softwares came about by leveraging the data of others and, and being able to seamlessly integrate without any sort of coordination or, or huge investment of implementation to integrate. That's unheard of in the PBM industry. And that has to do with every single kind of service provider. And in fact, in many cases, PBMs and PBM technology providers guard access to their data and their system as kind of an asset that they want to be able to monetize at the expense of everybody else. So it's just a completely different philosophy of how you connect and integrate with data. 
creating barriers between how, how uh, different parts of the healthcare system connect. So how did we get here? Many, many, many years of acquisitions and mega migrations. Right? I mean, the, the way that the, the, the largest PBMs gain their market share is from buying each other over and over and over and over again. Right? And when you do those acquisitions and you do the integration, you've got to choose, is it this system, is it that system? Let's hire a bunch of consultants. Let's do a two-year two project and figure out how we're just going to make it work. Right? Shove it through the hole. And at the end of the day, that's so overwhelming that nobody can ask themselves, is this really working? Does this serve the interests of our customers? And so those players in the industry that say, you know what? Our user experience, the payer experience, the member experience, it leaves a lot to be desired. Right? We're, we're, we're having many challenges. Why don't we just rebuild it from scratch? So someone comes up with a budget and says, like, oh, great. It's going to take us five years, and it's going to cost us $100 million. Okay, or $200 million, or $250 million. And the problem is, is that over the last decade, PBMs and, and you know, the entities that own them, whether they're owned by health plans or not, they're making so much money that, that they don't need to innovate. Right? Why change when you're laughing all the way to the bank? Is that making sense out here? Yeah. Right? So the, the competitive pressure, the market really hasn't made it happen because because of the uh, vertical integration and consolidation, everyone's just bought their way out of the problem. You have a problem? I'm just going to buy you. I'm going to buy you. I'm going to buy you. And that scale and how it's, been, how it's been leveraged for rebates and pharmacy network and the spreads that have been created there, it basically pays for everything else so they don't have to invest in the other parts of the business. You know, when, when you're invested in the status quo and, and you've achieved a certain level of success, it's, it's even difficult to think differently. And, and I'm sure that many of your organizations or your clients face those challenges today, where you want to think differently, but you just don't know where to start. Because your whole business is built around the current model. Breaking it to then rebuild it seems like something that's risky and, 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 and scary. And you know, payers in our country generally haven't been the most uh, aggressive takers of risk in pursuit of innovation. You know, net promoter score in the health, health care, health insurance industry is generally a bit ne net negative, right? Those of you who attend AMCP or AHIP have, you know, heard a lot about innovation. But when people think about innovation, the first place they don't think of is, you know, big insurance or, or big PBM, right? And so part of that is an unwillingness to take risk. It goes to the DNA of the company. It goes to the culture how they're incented, how they're rewarded, how they think about the regulatory framework, and how they think about competition. That's how we got here. And this challenge took decades to, have to, to, to get created. And it doesn't necessarily have to take decades more to get fixed, but it requires a different approach. So what are the costs of, of this way of thinking about technology in the PBM industry? First of all, adapting to clients' needs flexibly and, and efficiently is very difficult. That's, that's the, the most direct cost that everybody faces, right? It's, the answer is always why we can't do it. The member, the provider, and the payer experience is subpar. To be a little more elegant about it, it sucks, okay? And this is why you've seen in the consumer space companies like GoodRx and others grow incredibly quickly and, and achieve these crazy valuations based on solving a very, very small healthcare problem. Right? They're not even touching 2% of the healthcare problems in our country that, that some of the bigger payers have been, have been uh, wrestling with for, for a long time and really are investing uh, a lot of resources and smart, smart people and, and, and time into fixing. And so the, the, the companies with the biggest valuations in the market that are attracting the most capital, because they understand consumers, are you know, basically <laughs> changing the, the investment focus of our industry, and they're not really solving an important problem. I mean, what, cash is 5%, maybe 10% of the business, and it's great to save people money in cash, but 90% of the healthcare spend is really in the insured uh, population. The member experience, the provider experience. I mean, the amount of interoperability challenge when you have to go through the switch, and you have to go through, through you know, 50 million levels of, of auditing and implementation and payer sheets, and I can go on and on and on, puts an incredible burden on providers or on, on physicians when it, you're talking about their EMR, and whether they're going to use the SureScript system, or whether they're going to use the Cover My Meds, and you, know, and you can go on and on. The level of complexity and what it translates to in terms of the provider experience leaves a lot to be desired. Legacy systems weren't built with any of these stakeholders in mind. They're not designed to connect, as I said before, with consumer apps 
and services. And what that leads to is people think of PBM and immediately they think about pain. Like this is something that in the best case scenario is not going to be too painful. Well, that's not how value is created, right? We have to think about creating happiness, about creating awesomeness, about doing things in a completely different way so that tomorrow is not just it doesn't just work, but it works beyond my most wildest dreams about how I would like to work every day. When you talk about advanced analytics, when PBMs and their clients are, are working on solving the most basic problems, like did I set this benefit up correctly? Did I get the claim to pay correctly at the point of sale? Can I get the basic reporting that I need just to operate my business and pay my providers and you know, submit my regulatory frameworks? Like when all of your energy is going into that, there's really no time and mind share for how do I really drill deep into this data and start thinking about how do I predict my members' behavior? How do I get ahead of the future? And we have a lot, a lot, to, be a lot to, to be developed in our industry still. So what's our vision for the future? And I want to start a conversation and we'll leave a little bit of time here at the end to have a conversation, to ask questions, to share opinions. But what do we think PBMs and their clients need to think about in the future about a modern PBM platform. So one, it's all about integration, a unified experience. We're past the point where payers can afford to have seven or eight different systems that they go into and check in and check out of to try to do their work. I mean, it's completely unmanageable. Who, who wants to work in that environment? You know, the new workforce of millennials who have a different, maybe, standard of what they think is cool and what they think they're willing to invest their lives and their time in, they're, they're not willing to go through this incredible pain to learn 10 systems to be able to do their job. Right? So the unified experience is important. Secondly is, you know, you see it with, with the vertical integration of health insurers and PBMs. The value is all about integration. And so, by having claims processing separate from the rest of the clinical and business decision making, making needed to run an effectively integrated pharmacy program, you're holding back the opportunity to create value. So it's formulary management, it's clinical programs, especially around adherence, high cost members, high risk members, specialty drug management. It's connecting in with providers, with smart PAs and EPAs, all in one interconnected system that doesn't take a lot of effort to implement. It's member portals and apps, whether they're involved in the healthcare space or not. Right? We're, we're, we we as, as uh, health, health plans or, or, or payers, sometimes are a little bit too obsessed about having people sign up for our member portal, for our member app. Well, you know what? Most people don't want to sign up for the member app. They don't even want to think about their, their, their member portal. They want to use other apps that are relevant to them in their business, whether it's social apps or, or other apps that, that have to do with, with their consumer habits, with retail, you name it. Amazon is an example. So we need to figure out how to integrate with what happens in their life through data and give their data and their important healthcare data to them in a secure way to be leveraged by, by other players in the, in the ecosystem that understand their needs better than most healthcare companies do. It's the financial and the pricing. There's incredible complexity around changing price of drugs, whether it's rebates or net costs or you know, authorized generics, whatever you want to call it, right? There's thousands of drugs, their prices change every single day. And so you need to have a seamless system where inside of the system you can manage this, these changes to create the accountability and the, the cost management on a, on a true net basis that you need and have clarity and transparency around that. And for those that are, that are in government space, which probably covers, what, 50% of the country between Medicare and Medicaid, a little bit more, Compliance is extremely important. So it's not like you have to choose between a great user experience and compliance. You have to have both. Finally, as I mentioned before, analytics can't be completely outside of the system. I mean, there's amazing analytics software out there. You know, I can mention 10 names of data management tools, you know, visualization tools. And frankly, PBMs aren't going to be able to build analytics that, software that's, that's more competitive than those. The question is, how does it all integrate seamlessly in the sense that it provides the data to the data lakes or to the data warehouses or to the data marts, depending on how you structure it, um, or through APIs? And at the same time, how do you receive back real-time interventions and decision-making from outside data tools that go right back into the operation? 
and then you know rebates obviously is a big part of the conversation and I said at the beginning that we wouldn't talk about rebates so I'm going to skip that one. Second, flexible and adaptable. Plans want to control their destiny, okay, but they want to control it in a way that's commensurate with their capabilities. You know, a smaller employer doesn't want to be able to do that. So they're going to outsource that, that function to a PBM, and they want that PBM to be able to do what they need to do quickly, reliably, and, and efficiently. But health plans, who today and for the foreseeable future are going to administer the vast majority of lives in the United States of America, right? You know, managed care is here to stay, whether it's Medicare Advantage, whether it's Medicaid managed care, whether it's commercial MCOs or, or even you know, the, the uh, marketplace plans. Pa the payer experience in terms of how they administer benefits is directly related to the member experience and the provider experience. These are things as simple as having everything be parameter based and not depend on back end hard coding. And it's you know, more, more complex ideas like shortening release cycles and figuring out how to work in agile environments where you can really deliver innovation on a short cycle and, and iterate through it on a trial and error basis. And, and then finally, leveraging the power of the cloud. You know, we finally in healthcare got over this obsession with HIPAA as the, as the main obstacle to being able to, to leverage you know, the infrastructure advancements of the last decade. And you're seeing healthcare organizations learn how to use the cloud in very powerful ways. It allows them to deploy new software and infrastructure in ways that are both faster and a lot cheaper than before. How many PBM applications have, you, has, have people out here used that are not member apps, but apps for the, the staff that work at the PBM or at the, the payer that are mobile friendly? Raise your hand if you've used a mobile-friendly PBM app. For the record, there are zero hands raised. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's shyness or if there are none, but I don't think there are many. Right? People don't understand that in today's work environment, pharmacists, technicians who are doing prior authorizations, who are doing the drug utilization review, who are doing benefit setup, who are doing testing and QA, they have lives, they have children, they have travel. They don't want to be sitting at their desk all the time doing their work. People need to be able to work from wherever, whenever, at any time. And that, that includes enterprise software applications, that, including those that run PBMs. We already talked about user friendliness, right? intuition. Something that when I open it up every day, I, I, take a deep, I take a deep breath and I go, wow, I'm lucky that I get to work with an application that's so easy and simple that makes my job better. And I'm excited about what's going to be delivered tomorrow in terms of innovation that's going to, give my, that, that's going to make my job even better. Is that the experience that we're feeling today in the PBM industry? I'm getting a lot of head shaking, no. It's like, oh, what, uh, what new problem am I going to have, right? So it's all about thinking about the user experience in enterprise applications as being a key driver of value creation. We're not harnessing the power of our staff in payers, in PBMs, and everybody in the ecosystem who supports us because we're putting them through unnecessary pain and suffering that is sapping our creative abilities. We talked about API. Building an open architecture that's secure, HIPAA compliant, right, is important. And there's many different applications across the payer landscape that need to integrate with the PBM stack that currently don't. So it's, it's applications as, base, as, as basic as the core administration system of a health plan. Um, you know, some people call it medical claims processing. It's the care management systems, the provider management systems. Switching gears to financial. You, know, you can't make decisions unless your, your claims processing and your financials is directly integrated into your general ledger, into your ERP. If not, you've got to build all these expensive and complicated workarounds that break to take data from one system and clean it up and then put it into another system. That saps a limited budget of, of, of IT resources and it creates an opportunity for something to break and create a problem for you or for your client down the road. Right? So financial accounting, very important. Connecting with the EHR world, right? ER, ERX, EPA. We're still in the infancy of electronic prescriptions and, and, and prior authorizations in terms of what can be done there and how APIs uh, are going to be leveraged. There's a couple of networks out there that have a dominant market share. It's not very open, but there's an opportunity to open it more in the future. HR software, for those that are focused on the employer space. I mean, implementing employer plans with TVAs and, and you know, HR, 
it's really complicated and challenging for them to figure out, okay, how do I get my member file out of here in my eligibility? How do I, you know, how do I get uh, my claims data back in in a secure way and, and, and how I can manage it from, from a payments perspective. Basic things like, like APIs with, with HR software don't exist in the PBM in, industry. There's no excuse for this. It's a huge opportunity. And, and, and the future is definitely going to include it. Other health data sources, you know, whether it's providers, um, whether it's labs, PBMs just generally don't talk. Don't plug and play. And so the, 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 AP, the uh, PBM apps of the future are going to be completely integrated. And I mentioned before, consumer apps. Everything from Amazon all the way down the line. And, and the, the open API framework is going to generate an incredible amount of innovation that, do, that doesn't exist today in the current mentality. And finally, future ready. I'm not a big fan of buzzwords. You don't hear me saying the word blockchain very often, right? You know, buzzwords, people like to attach to these new concepts that have hype, but, but we're, not, we're not about them. Having said that, artificial intelligence has the opportunity to create an incredible efficiency in the PBM world, especially around automated clinical decision making. We have incredible data sets, millions and millions of decisions and claims about whether we're going to cover or not cover a specific product for a patient. We have the opportunity to eliminate thousands of hours of time and effort of going back and forth between providers and patients and PBMs using, yes, you heard it, the fax machine in some cases. You guys still use a fax machine in your business? No. Good. Well, those of you who said no, I'm, I'm very happy to hear that. But a lot of people in our industry are still using fax machines to communicate important medical information. And so, Forget about the decision-making process. Artificial intelligence isn't even being leveraged in healthcare. It's leveraged to help you figure out you know, what movie you want to watch next. It's leveraged to figure out what other products you might want to buy right, when you buy your dog food or your toilet paper. But in terms of figuring out how could I avoid putting this patient and this provider through this set of hoops to figure out whether this product is the right one for them in terms of value, we're not leveraging AI. So the systems of the future are going to be leveraging AI to take human beings out of critical decision making in a way that accelerates and improves the clinical and business decision making process of PBMs. Secondly, it needs to be supporting new business models. The PBM business model is very stuck in its ways about you know, discounts and network and rebates, right? I mean, everybody wants to talk about all that all the time in terms of pricing. But you need to think about different business models like capitation, Right. Other kinds of ways of thinking about business, and the systems need to be able to support it. And finally, the power of the cloud to scale and change the way that data is processed in the PBM industry is still in its infancy. Right. Having a cloud native architecture is critical to the PBMs of the future. And so those that are, that are, that are talking about the cloud are ahead of the game. And, and it's important to, to, to have that conversation. So with that, what's going to drive this change? It's already happening. First of all and foremost, plan sponsors and members must demand a better experience. We've been talking to people across the country over the last few years, and it's clear that, that the frustration has reached a boiling point. You're seeing those changes happening now. Secondly, big tech is getting into healthcare in a big way. You see it with Apple and some of the devices. You see it with Google in terms of the investments that they're making in, in insurance and in Verily. And you see it with Amazon with the, the pill pack acquisition in a number of other areas. But they're just getting started. And so having, sm and, and also the Amazon uh, Berkshire JP Morgan collaboration, which is still in its infancy. Coming to the PBM and to the healthcare industry in general is forcing the players in our industry to innovate. It's basically innovate or get your lunch eaten. It's not going to happen overnight, but in five years from now, when we're here together having this discussion, it's going to be a completely different landscape because of the pressure coming from big tech. Third, data security. Data security is changing the way that we think about healthcare. Whether you call it phishing or spear phishing, and I mean, I, I don't, I'm not an expert in all the different forms, but our identities are now the most important uh, asset in the dark web. And so the, the PBM industry needs to figure out that balance, and many have already gotten hacked, but 
figure out that balance between being flexible and being open at the same time uh, managing security. And finally, and, and unfortunately, probably most immediately and most importantly, it's regulatory changes. It's interesting how the market hasn't really forced the PBM industry to change as much as the conversation in Washington. And, and frankly, for many of us who are in this industry, I think that, that, that that's an important reflection about what kind of innovators are we? What kind of value creators are we when we have to rely on Washington, D.C. and regulators to tell us what's the right way to create value in our business? And so we believe that these are going to be the four imperatives that are driving the change. So with that, join the revolution. We're just getting started. Thank you very much.